in preparation for Rich's lesson, I'll be reading from the 12th chapter of 2 Corinthians, verses 7 through 10. Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Appreciate your presence this morning. Our, I'll try to not be too long, but don't worry, you won't miss your sporting event. The Cubs' first pitch is at 220. You'll be like quite fine. I don't know what else there is to watch, you know. Our bodies are amazing. They are God designed, designed for several purposes. It gives us great strength in, intellectually using our resources, but it also gives us great weaknesses. They are mortal bodies. We wear out. You know, our minds go bad, our joints get arthritis, and we are vulnerable to injury. However, we need to also be wary of thorns in our flesh, both physical and spiritual. The title of this lesson is simply called A Thorn. I appreciate Brother Austin's reading in 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter. In the first 12, you know, we'll read verses 1 through 5. It is not expedient, Paul writes by inspiration, for me doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such a one caught up to the third heaven. I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. If, I, if such a one will I glory. It, of such a one that will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. Lots of mysteries. What is the third heaven? You know what? If you were to walk up to 100 Bible scholars, you'll get 100 different opinions on what the third heaven is, most likely. But Paul talks about these things, but he can't be prideful because maybe he's gotten to see some of these things that... It's hard for us to understand to this day, but in verse 6 through 10, it says, For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth. But now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Now, what is this thorn in the flesh? Who is this messenger of Satan? Well, Paul is given something that's obviously not very pleasant. It's something that is causing problems, whether it's a physical problem or a spiritual problem, we don't really know. But it seems that it's taking away his self-importance. He talks about all those things he saw in verses 1 through 5, but 
he's also taken down a peg because okay you got to see these things now you're gonna suffer you're gonna feel these thing this thorn in the flesh and why should we be avoiding exaltation man's exalting is well it really needs to be avoided it's nice to have people say oh you did this you did that great aren't you wonderful but it really doesn't help men usually are not exalting at a god-centered worldview you know we need to be humble you know james 4 and verse 6 but he giveth more grace wherefore he saith god resisteth the proud but giveth grace unto the humble we see in verse 8 of second corinthians 12 again you know he for this thing i besought the lord thrice that it might depart from me so three times Paul is praying to God to take away this, this thorn in the flesh, this unknown problem. Of course, it sounds like he might have been beseeching Jesus because it is in red, right, in verse 9. And he said to me, Thy gra my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. You know what? Prayer is important, but sometimes the answer from the Lord is no. Have you ever prayed and prayed for a family member that was dying to be spared? And they die anyway. How many times we say, well, Lord, save my job, and the job is not saved. Paul says, you know, I'm going to serve the Lord regardless of the answer. Because the Lord has given me grace. He's given all of us grace and the opportunity to take advantage of that. We will serve the Lord nonetheless. You know what? I've discovered with each passing birthday that I'm not getting younger. You know, my, my high jump has not improved, if it exists at all. It never was much, you know. I, would, I remember in high school, they would do these things to see what you could do. Like, can you climb that rope? Nope. Can you do a vertical jump? Well, I could jump and I can go vertically. Now, how high I go was not very good ever. Now, let's just say PE kept me off the honor roll more times than I care to think. But Paul will serve the Lord nevertheless. You know, what was Paul's thorn in the flesh? We really don't know. It might have been a physical illness, it might have been an injury, maybe it was just a temptation. Paul wasn't married, so there are temptations that come when you're not married. And I remember talking to married guys saying, well, you must have it made. You don't have the problems of being married and the temptation. He goes, no, nah, it's just a different kind of temptation. You just get a different uh, view of what temptation is. So what are our thorns in the flesh? Yes, it can be physical illnesses. It can be disabilities. You know, maybe it's high blood pressure. Maybe it's low blood pressure. Maybe it's just simply when things just don't go right. Have you ever had a situation like that where nothing ever goes right this day or this week or this month or this year? What do you do? Well, the temptations are there. In the first chapter of James in verse 12, blessed is the man that endureth temptation for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. You know, verse 14, it says, when we are tempted when we're drawn away of our own lust. You know what? Some people, it's the lust of the flesh. Some people, it's the lust of wealth. Some, it's the lust of pride. They want people to say how wonderful they are. And 
they will do those things. You know, there's a chink in everybody's armor. What might affect me may not affect anyone else. And what might affect you, I may not even think anything of it. So, Paul, you know, he wasn't married. As we said, there were temptations there. I'm married, and I've got lots of temptations still. You know, so temptations are can be a thorn in the flesh. Another thorn could be a lack of self-control. And we go to James again in the third chapter. Verses one, verse 1, it says, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same as a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouth that they may obey us, and we churn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so, the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beast, and of birds, and of serpents, and of things in the sea is tamed, and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father. And therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be. To control our talking, what we say, what we do. You know, when someone's in the room, do we say nice things to them? When they leave, we are instantly talking bad about them. We need to control our tongue because eventually it will catch up to us. You know, in verse 29 of Ephesians 4, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. You know, people are saying, where does it say, you know, the curse? Well, you know what? Corrupt communication. What is a corrupt word can, is often based on society, yes. But you know what? We need to watch what we say, that we're not saying evil or saying things that could be construed as such. Our self-control, the temperance, it's very important. You know, Galatians, the fifth chapter, it talks about the things of the Spirit, the things of the flesh verse 16 this i say then walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh for the lust lit listeth against the spirit lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh and these are contrary the one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would but if you be led of the spirit you are not under the law now the works of the flesh are manifest which are these adultery fornication uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. These are signs of a lack of self-control as the Lord has mandated, you know, you know, I turn on the morning news. What are they talking about? They're all at the 500. And I was on our way to, to the services. And I was talking to Sheila. And I said, I wonder how many people are drunk as skunks right now. And will spend tomorrow hung over. And, you know, because of this lack of self-control. It's, oh, it's the 500. It's the day that we can do these things. No, there's never a day to do what God has against God's commandments. You know. We need to do the things that gives us self-control. The, the fruit of the Spirit in verse 22 is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. 
and they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit, and let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking or irritating one another, envying one another. You see, we need to keep the thorns out of our souls with the self-control and the obedience of God's commands. And doing those things, we will follow. You know, John 14 and 15, you know, he who, if you love me, keep my commandments. And he, it goes through that through verse 21. To do those things that indicates we love God. We love Jesus. Do we do those things? Do we follow the word? Yes, we're going to trip up, but we need not walk in that. You know, if you're drowning in the water and you get out, are you? should you go back in? No, you don't want to do that. You don't want to drown yourself when you've already saved yourself from drowning. You know, what do you look at someone who is an old drunk, an alcoholic, and you get them get them to the dry out clinic and they're all dry and they're free of their addictions and then one little thing goes wrong and they go right back to it. You know, what did Samuel say to Saul when he had not destroyed a, ta you know, a town, country, 1 Samuel 15? You know, what was he supposed to do? Well, Samuel looks at him in 1 Samuel 15 and verse 22. Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord he hath also rejected thee from being king. We can do all these things and say, oh, we're doing great things, but if it's not obedient, we need to realize that we need to obey because it's better than anything else. What is better than all the, all the burnt offerings? What is better than all the sacrifices that we could give? Are we sacrificing our time coming here? I hope not. I hope we're not saying that we're sacrificing something that we'd rather be doing. Mark 12 and verse 28. In verse 28 it says, And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, what is, which is the great commandment, the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him the first of all the commandments is hear O Israel the Lord our God is one Lord and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength this is the first commandment and the second is like namely this thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself there is none other great commandment greater than these and the scribe said to him well master thou hast said the truth for there is one God and there is none other than, but he and to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding <coughs> excuse me and with all the soul and with all the strength and to love his neighbor as himself is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices and when Jesus saw that he answered discreetly he said to him thou art not far from the kingdom of God and no man after that dared ask him any question because to obey God is better than anything else we can do you know they're saying well, I want to do this great feat I want to do this great wonderful work you know what you can still do that and still obey God just do the great things in that frame to do it and to do it righteously. To do it and do it in a way that pleases God. And also, we have with obedience, there's the temperance, the self-control. 
you know, Revelation 2.10, and you know, it says, you know, be faithful unto death. It means we need to stick to what we do. We obey the gospel. What do we do after that? I've run into people saying, well, I've, been, I've been saved and I'm always saved no matter what I do. No, we're supposed to stick to it. Be faithful unto death. Because things will get worse. Endurance will reward us. You know, it also talks about that in Matthew 24, 3 through 13. You know what? How many people are faithful when something bad happens? As people get older, things happen. Maybe you have heart disease and you, or you can't do things as well as you could. The joints get arthritic. The knees hurt. It's harder to walk. It's harder to do things that you could do with ease just a few years before. Maybe we've suffered disabilities or persecutions. One of my, my grandmother had a cousin. I guess that means he was my cousin too. He had a massive stroke and lived for years. He could not move. He could only he could not speak and he could only communicate with eye blinks. Could you imagine how hard that would be? What would you do to, with God? How many people would say would basically curse God and die, like Job's wife told him to do, if they're in that situation? Is that living? How many people would say, kill me? They would want to kill themselves, commit the sin of self-murder. You know what, folks? Eternity in torture is a lot better than 10 to 20 years of living like that. Can you imagine living like that? You know, that's one of the things that frightens me. But, you know what? It, it can happen. And that could be your thorn in the flesh. Not necessarily the physical thorn, although that certainly be a problem. But to lose your faith over it. And you'll discover it's much better to stay faithful and say, I can sit still for a little while. The thorns of Satan are his temptation. Could be physical, could be spiritual. But it need not ruin us. That's our lesson. There's been invitation songs selected. The invitation applies to you in any fashion. Please come forward. Make your wants known while we stand and while we sing.